All right. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for Marketing Moneyball, Driving Growth with Limited Resources. My name is Jake Randall. I'm the COO here at Common Room, and I'm joined today by Andy Ramirez, the VP of Growth at New Relic. Um, Andy's done a lot of great th- stuff over his career at AWS, Smart Sheet, and now New Relic. We're thrilled to have him to share some of his learnings and best practices on connecting marketing performance with tangible metrics. Um, and really, I think even more interesting, starting to tap into some of the maybe less well-known areas of marketing where you can really find that, that leverage and differentiate yourself and your brand. So with that, um, why don't we do a quick intro, Andy? Tell us about yourself. Yeah, thank you for... Uh... Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, as Jake said, I work for a company called New Relic, which is in the observability space, helping uh, companies keep their apps, their websites, their business critical systems, uh, stay online and getting ahead of issues before your customers find them. Uh, and I've been doing digital marketing or some form of marketing, uh, let's, let's say since MySpace was a thing. Uh, so it's been a while. And uh, you know, I've, I've grown up through the system of understanding and playing with the technology side of things. I started my career actually uh, as an IT administrator, IT manager. And so I was able to parlay deep technical understanding into how to leverage those those things and the data centricity that comes with IT, for example, with how to create a marketing engine that's based off of driving growth and and measuring what you do and, and, you know, less on the brand side and more on the the growth side. Love that. Um, So since you kind of mentioned it already, and we've got a diverse set of folks that are, you know, tuning in or will be listening afterwards. Um, you just kept talking about growth. Talk to me about growth marketing versus demand gen. I think those are often maybe confused terms. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I I wouldn't be able to tell you the dictionary definition. I have my own though. <laughs> Right. That's what I want, um, to be clear. I don't want, you know, <laughs> everyone's here live. We want to hear what Andy says. Not yeah, what, so, you know, so yeah. It, it's a shift that happened not long ago, right? And, and being that I've been around marketing for so long, the way it showed up for me is demand generation really focused on just the top of the funnel, right? You, your job was to get the leads, the signups, the, the sales on the e-commerce website, whatever it was. And then from there, you kind of washed your hands of it. And growth marketing is really more around taking that deeper into the funnel. In fact, going all the way through to how do we prevent churn? How do we prevent loss of customers? And so you participate as a marketer in all aspects of the customer lifecycle, not just getting them through the door. And I think you know, for, that's a change for the better because we've gotten much better as marketers as we've learned to do that. I love that. I think it also speaks to, and you know, I know we'll touch on this a bit later, in our conversation, but just the changing customer journey, right? The way that people are discovering and adopting technologies is, you know, is, is changing. And there's, that means that there's huge opportunities to really think about things differently. Um, so I think that's a great definition. So obviously the, the, the title of our talk here is uh, Marketing Moneyball. I think that's a, a term that I learned certainly from, from you, Andy. And so, why don't you tell us a bit, give us that, give us a definition of that also, since you've given us your definition of growth marketing and demand, Jen, talk a little bit about marketing money ball, where did it come from? How do you think about it? Yeah. I, you know, I, I, um, I never really used that term until my, my current boss actually coined it. He looked at the way that I approach marketing and how I kind of uh, make use cases, justify plays, you know, you know, talk about the things that we're doing and what's causal to change versus correlated to change versus, a wild guess with maybe some tangential connection to something else. And he's like, you know, you, what you do is you moneyball marketing. And, and I really thought about it. And I, you know, I'm a big fan of, of the movie Moneyball and, and um, the, the, the book as well. And, yep. you know, the whole concept of Moneyball is doing everything you can to statistically increase your chances of winning. And that really is what, what I do as a marketer is I don't, I don't rely solely and only on what I can prove. I take calculated risks, I make bets, and I look for facets across all kinds of things, right? You look at geography, you look at day part, you look at audience, you look at channel, you look at campaign creative, and you have all of these things. And I, you know, I kind of picture myself as like that Charlie Day character from, from always sunny in Philadelphia with the board of strings and and, doing his detective work. And, and that's what it is. You're constantly looking for ways to prove a, a hypothesis 
and, and roll out some marketing that actually causes a change to the results you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. So my brother-in-law actually runs like saber metrics, I guess, in the, in the, in the baseball parlance for uh, the LA Dodgers. And uh, so is in the money ball world. And now I'm only going to picture him as, as Charlie day. <laughs> so thank you for that. That's so great. <laughs> um, what I, I think one more question on that is it's a really interesting framework that you're laying out. Just how have you, and you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, growth marketing and marketing in general can now affect, you know, all the stages of the funnel. So how have you kind of used this money ball framework um, across your organization? Yeah. So time is actually one of the most important facets in, in yeah. what I call money balling. Right. And the reason that's important is because you have things that are happening in your business today, right? Customers that are rebuying or renewing or churning out or whatever it is. And if you can trace that back in your very Charlie Day way to what was going on when you first acquired them, what were you doing at that time? What changed? What is the thing that got these customers? And you start thinking about them in cohorts. You can yeah. then look at later aspects of the life cycle and say, hold on, this channel over here that I thought wasn't as productive is producing some of my largest growing customers, some of my highest renewing customers, so much, so much more of my uh, repurchasing customers, those kinds of things, right? And so yeah. it, it's really hard to do that because we get so inundated with data, right? Yeah. And, and we get lost in this mess and quagmire. But if you get good at it and you, you do the things you've got to do to be able to make those correlations, then you can take what happens later and translate it back to what you should have done or could do more of in the past or shouldn't have done in the past and then change what you're doing today, right? So that yeah. you can repeat those results. Love that. Um... And I think, and then the more you start sharing that with those different people, whether it be sales or CS to the point of where marketing can continue to play, then people can sort of figure out that, that customer journey as it may be. Right. Yeah, and exactly. can, yeah awesome. Um, so talk a little bit about, I know, I know when I talk to our customers, the so marketers that are using, you know, common room, um, you know, one of the big things that people talk about is AI right? Apparently we're all going to lose our jobs um, <laughs> because the machines will just go do it. And, you know, fortunately, actually one of the fun things is that uh, OpenAI is a big customer of, of Common Room. So we get to work closely with them on various different aspects of it. But kind of like, how do you think about some of these current trends in growth marketing? How do you think about AI specifically, I guess? Yeah. I mean, so AI is not going anywhere, right? And, and yep. it's been around for a very long time. Uh, there's been lots of companies that have been doing AI, even language learning model kind of stuff successfully since before open AI. But, you know, the, the launch of chat GPT was kind of akin to like the very first time a nuclear bomb went off. Like that's how much the world changed yeah. when that moment happened. Right. And, and the reality is that, um, if we let it run its, its course, what'll happen is a balance will be struck because you can't keep training models and the models training themselves and putting out content. And, you know, if all of the internet just becomes AI generated content, then it's just going to become this flat circle of nothingness, right? So the humans, the people that do the stuff that add the extra on top of the AI are still very much needed. And so as marketers, you know, and what I talk to my teams about is how can we leverage it to increase our scale, to show up in places we're not today, to, to do more with less, and then focus our attention, the human attention, on those areas where we can make that difference, right? We, we let the AI do the 80% of the work that's easy and ben benign and, and repetitive. And then we add that 20% that makes it awesome, right? And that's the piece that we really got to get into and, and adopting as marketers with this thing instead of living so much in fear of it. Uh, because it's, you know, it's the horse and buggy thing. It's, it, the car's not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I think it just... It forces everyone to really think about how they can up their game to, to stand out, what you're yeah. saying, which is great. And I think the other topic that comes up a lot um, that, you know, with what you mentioned around tracking data and, you know, money balling things is all the challenges for the, you know, work from home, cookie lists, all the changes happening there. And so how do you think about that when it comes to, you know, everything that, that, that you're doing to pull the levers? Yeah, it, it's amazing how much the world has changed for those two reasons, right? Work from yeah. home and cookie list. Work from home, 
there used to be, and there still are industries that rely heavily on figuring out who you are or who your company is based on your IP address. Yeah. That was easy when a company owned a block of 10 IP addresses. Yep. Uh, now it's represented by 2,800 at New Relic, right? Or whatever our yeah. current employee count is. And so it doesn't make as much sense. And, and similarly, it, the ability to attribute marketing data across websites, we all know is going away in a very meaningful way. And so what does that mean, right? Like what's going to happen? I like to imagine that we're actually going to go a little bit backwards in time. Right. When marketing first started or when I first started in marketing, I should say, because it's been around a hell of a lot longer than me, um, getting to the right audience involved, finding the right websites that had that audience, finding forums, finding yeah. uh, places where I can interact, communities, if you will. Right. And yeah. those used to be the big thing because all those people, they knew their audiences. They had a newsletter subscription list. They had people they interacted with and they had their first party information. So you went to them and you said, hey, you advertise to those folks, please, for me. And now that the ability to cross market and follow folks across websites is going away, those walled gardens are going to come back to the, to the marketers of the world and say, hey, we're still here and we can yeah. do a really good job of targeting this audience, right? And so companies actually like yours that can help kind of bridge the gap between what's happening in those walled gardens and those communities yep. and, and give me insight so I know where to go reach out to and where to spend my money are going to win out in this whole cookie-less future because you're the ones that can market. They're the ones that can market. Uh, to these companies and these users. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. Well, one, thanks for the for the plug. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think it's really interesting. You know, one of the things that we see is that the it's interesting that because everyone's working from home, right? We're all here on this, you know, webinar versus meeting in person. Un, un, unfortunately, people are more digitally connected than ever. Right. And people still long for those interactions and those in that community. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen around the proverbial water cooler anymore. Right. Yeah. But there are those, as you call them, walled gardens where it is happening. And if you can tap into those, that's a really interesting angle. So I, yeah. I love that. Um, so I think the next topic when it comes to, you know, marketing money ball, I guess, to dive into would be how do you think about and it may, kind of touches on this walled gardens aspect, but finding that in, intent and like tracking at, attribution, right? So where do you know, how, how do you know where to invest? How do you, you know, approach getting to these people that you need to access given some of the challenges that you mentioned? Yeah, no, that's, it's a great question, right? And, and the thing is like, that's where you have to be vigilant and you have to look at your data like data isn't just so you can report on your results, right? I actually think it's less for that. Data is so that you can take action, figure out what's going on and go do something about it, right? And so, you know, my team and I and my teams and I in the past have constantly looked at data on a daily basis and said, what's happening that's not normal here, <laughs> right? Whether it's yep. good or it's bad, like what's going on today that I need to go figure out and go look at? And so you find these moments where, uh, you know, some champion on Reddit starts a thread that's all about you for some reason. And it gets a lot of commentary and suddenly you're getting a lot more direct traffic, right? Mm -hmm. How do you correlate those things? You, it's really hard to do, right? So you monitor what's going on in your, in your sentiment measurement channels or, or your third party analytics tools that measure those kinds of walled gardens. And then you look at your website data, you look at what's going on and you say, hey, this day is strange. Let's dig into it. Okay, we've got some referral increase from Reddit. We've got some direct increase, which means people just typing in our URL and a bunch of new organic searches. So clearly someone's out there saying something. Let's go figure yeah. out who that is. And, and the next question is, can I do something about it? <laughs> right? Yeah. Can, I, can I pay that person? Can I, can I entice that person to do it more often? Or do I just have to enjoy the ride and, and move on to the next thing? Yeah, super interesting. Um, what maybe a little, a little side of like, what are, you're kind of starting to get into these, like, these new channels, essentially. That's kind of what I'm hearing, right? Is, hey, can I, you know, can I pay that person to go do more of that, right? Um, so almost to like go back one question of, in terms of what are some of the changes that you're seeing, like just spend a little bit of time. Um, what are some of those new channels that are really ec ec exciting to you that you're trying to tap into? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the channels we've all counted on forever still are there, right? You can do display and video ads, the GDN, yeah. the Adobe ad networks, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can go directly to the LinkedIn's and the Reddit's and advertise with them, but there are really cool new channels that are propping up around even in B2B, right? You can now go find influencers and, yeah. and get them to help you move the needle, right? You can go find uh, very niche communities 
that that don't seem like a good investment because it, you know they they have maybe three thousand users and you're like what why is that going to be good? Well, yeah. every one of those users is a high value target for you, right? Yeah. So so your your capture rate of of people you want to see your ad or whatever it is your offer is a hundred percent. And there's so much more of that, right? I I think we were talking last week and and you brought up this kind of concept of the dark funnel, right? Yeah. And and the dark funnel is a channel, right? It yeah. is the thing you need to go figure out how to. Um, influence, right? You can't control it. It is what it is for a reason, but you certainly can feed it and influence it and make yourself a company that shows up there more often by virtue of how you present yourself. At New Relic, for example, we invest heavily in in a developer relations team and they're out there just being there for people and being not just champions of New Relic, but actually champions of technology and, and improvement for people, which then garners trust and garners people wanting to talk about us because we're doing good by them. And so then we show up more in places where we normally can't pay to show up. Yeah. I, the way I, I heard this talked about, which I love is this idea of the, like a shift in the trust paradigm and what I think people are saying or what they mean when they say that is that back to this idea that everyone's now working from home or we're digitally connected people like they, they're going to access information differently. We've all over the last several years kind of learned to operate differently. And, you know, I joke, you know, when I need to buy a, you know, a holiday toy for my daughter, I end up on some YouTube channel looking at comparisons of it. Right. Well, the same thing happens when I want to go buy technology for my, for my business, right. From a B2B standpoint, I'm not going to necessarily always trust the website. No offense to marketers. But there are people out there, third parties, that are going to say, hey, you're looking for X solution. Well, here's a comparison of these two solutions, right? Should you use on HubSpot or Salesforce for your CRM? To use an easy one, it probably won't offend anyone, right? And I think yeah. that's what you're getting towards. There are these channels out there that you don't own that if you can influence them are super interesting, right? Yeah, and these and kind of sub-communities of people talking about stuff. The customers in these channels, like we, we just... I, I do, and I think now most marketers do, but for a long time, marketers did not give customers nearly enough credit. We just imagined yeah. every customer out there is like some zombie with a wallet in their hand running around handing out money. Yeah. And, and the reality is that customers are more complicated and, and more enabled to do deep dive analysis of whatever it is that they're shopping for than ever before, whether it be a Christmas toy or a $400,000 a year software solution, right? Yeah. And, and for example, me, Sure, I check the boxes if I'm buying software. I go to G2, I go to all the places. And then I start looking for, all right, show me everything that isn't that that happened in the last six months and filtering like crazy on Google to try to find those folks that are having real experiences that didn't get paid to do that, right? And so it's those kinds of things that we have to understand and remember our customers are doing regularly, like every time now. Yeah, yeah, and you all, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you mentioned the phrase dark funnel. It's a little bit of a, of a buzzword. And so I've asked you to, to d- define several things now. So why don't we, can you do a quick definition of a dark funnel to keep that, that trend going? Yeah, it, it is the people, it, you know, I almost think of it as, as oddly in a weird way, dark marketing. It is okay. people that are marketing you or marketing your product, whether it's good or bad, in a place that, that you're not in control of, that you're not even part of the conversation, right? So uh, in some like local communities, that might be word of mouth, right? Yeah. In some large scale digital software solutions, it's those niche uh, communities we talked about or Reddit or, or even just like private slacks or, or within an organization, teams talking about a solution, right? Like those are the things that happen where uh, people are representing you and your company and your product, your solution, whatever it is. And what all you can do is either try to understand when stuff is going on there, because now we do have some tools that let us yep. have visibility into that. And two, try to make sure that the right information is available in those yep. channels or to those people so that they're not misinforming each other. Okay. Yeah, it makes total sense. And so are there, are, are there ways, I guess, you kind of mentioning it, but from like a, from marketing money ball, ways you're trying to tap into that, that you're like looking at it from, yeah, from ways to affect those those outcomes, right? Yeah, so there, there's, you know, everything's different for everyone, I'll say, but yeah. we've got some tactics that we try to at least give us some insight, right? So for example, uh, when we send out our DevRel folks, we give them custom links and QR codes they can use and things like that that are specific to them. They're unlisted in Google. The only way you can get them is through one of them. 
And we regularly see those start to show up in other channels. And it helps me kind of start to connect the dots like this event in Bangalore suddenly created a bunch of people visiting from New York in that channel because they either have teams out there or they attended that event because they were traveling, whatever it was. Right. And so these kinds of little things, another great tip or trick that we've been using is, is the use of swag, right? Like yeah. uh, people don't hate t-shirts and hats as much as they used to anymore. Uh, yeah. They'll take them. And so if you give people a, a way to kind of get that, that you try to limit or at least create different paths to from different types of communities or different places, you yeah. then again, start seeing the uptick and the behavior and, and the outreach from those places. Now, you know, I know that there's also now much more uh, intelligent solutions that can actually look at those places and say, uh, have partnerships with them or have ways to dig into their APIs and see what's actually happening. Who's actually talking about you, right? Yeah. You've got these companies that, that are quote unquote walled gardens aren't as walled as you think because they don't mind selling access to their open graph and that kind of stuff, right? So there are lots of ways you can also start listening in, if you will, to yeah. also tie it to the, the things that you're doing. Yeah, I think that's interesting. It's in it, there's intent and context out there. Like I always yeah. joke, people you know are telling you what they care about. You're just not always listening, right? And so yeah. if you can listen in and understand that, then that means you can serve them. You know, from a marketing standpoint, maybe you can serve them better content, right? Because they're telling you, here's what I really care about. Right. Yeah, it's more than just a funnel, right? It's it's yeah. it's a customer satisfaction survey that's that's yeah. ever growing. It is a it is a, a, a idea farm for your next product. Uh, solution or implementation, right? It's, yeah. it's all of those things. So you should be listening. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, you know, common room helps with that. Let's not try to fool anyone, right? Um, but, you know, we call that your, com your community, right? And community isn't a single place. It's anyone who's out there talking about the problems that, that you solve, right? right. Um, and that can be, as we've, you know, we've talked about Twitter or LinkedIn or, you know, there's subreddits about stuff, right? And that's all your community You've worked at, I think all the organizations that you've worked at, AWS, Smartsheet, New Relic, all ended up having very strong user communities. Um, so maybe just spend a little bit of time on where do you see, you know, the growth marketing team's relationship to those communities? Yeah, I, I mean, one, growth marketing goes hand in hand with those communities, not just from a paid perspective, right? What we do organically to be there and show up for our customers is, is really, really important. Uh, the other thing is that I think uh, for my team and my teams that I've had is is to expand on that, right? There are there are lots of people talking about you on Twitter and Reddit and LinkedIn and et cetera, et cetera. But they also want to be able to have a spot they can come talk to just you or mm -hmm. just your users, right? And Smartsheet's a great example of a, a really strong community that was uh, started as a purely support community, right? They were there helping each other, but they were just so active that we asked them like, hey, do you want to just be able to talk about other stuff, like ideas for how to do yeah. things using the solution, that kind of stuff. And, and it blew up like in a good way, right? Yeah. And so giving folks places to interact with each other and have a shared um, uh, aspect of what they're talking about is a valuable tool. And it gives you not just more people to talk to, but it also gives you the ability to ensure that people have that uh, enablement as they go out to the external communities. They know what's what, right. they have access to you and they can go correct misinformation or, or provide new information to customers that you might not otherwise be able to reach. Yeah, I love that. And then they can, and then they spread the word and they're helping you in the dark funnel or however you want to think about it, right? And yeah. all those fun things. It's, yeah. it's making champions without even having to have a champions program. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a brilliant, everyone, you know, I always joke, it's like whenever you're, whenever you're looking at anything, yeah, the, the vendor will say, Oh, do you want to you know, talk to a reference customer? And you're like, yeah, sure. But you really, but you're going to go find one of your peers. Right. Yeah. That's and it's so stacked. It. Right. Right. Have it's, you ever yeah. had a bad reference when you did yeah, that? No. Like, never. Yeah, right. Yeah. right? <laughs> um, and so, and then we can, you know, you'll dive into that. So, okay, cool. Well, um, maybe, to try to kind of wrap it up here. And then I want to make sure that we have some time for, for questions. Uh, we talked about a bunch of things. Maybe if you could share some, some quick wins um, that you see that are kind of low hanging fruit opportunities, right. That growth marketers could use today. Right. As we look at, you know, AI or dark funnels, all the things that we've talked about, right. What's those kind of pieces of 
to suggestion for folks? Yeah, I mean, there, there's one, I mentor quite a few folks. I, I really yeah. love doing it, right? And there's one common piece. There of you go. So always... everyone should email you afterwards and say, <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. So if, yeah, if, yeah. If, if you want a, a, a bit of a spaz to mentor you, I, I'd be happy <laughs> to. Um, but one common piece of advice that I always give folks in marketing is don't stop at just the marketing metrics. Deep yeah. dive and learn your entire business's metrics. Hmm. Right. What what is your retention rate? What yeah. is your conversion rate? What is your ARR, CRR, or recurring revenue? What are all of those numbers? Because what happens is you can't really do money ball, right? You can't work yeah. backwards from the end result if you stopped at, well, we drove this much pipeline or this many leads or this yeah, many, this many MQLs. Products, right? right. It yeah. doesn't stop there. So so you have to constantly poke. And and even if you have to annoy other teams and say, like, look, I need access to your reports, uh, go do it, right? Because that's where the, the good ideas will come from. That's how you like start this whole money ball, money ball marketing engine thing. Um, and then after that, the, the next thing, and this is, this is another kind of related win, right? But build yourself the best idea of a funnel and the conversion rates and the ROI or the, the worth of each stage, right? So if, if your job is to create MQLs, figure out what an MQL is really worth, what an SAL is really worth, what an opportunity is really worth, right? Because that's how you back out of, that into your marketing. And then by the way, you can go to your CFO and say, Hey, we need more budget. Here's the justification. And if I yeah. stay within these numbers, everything's all right. Um, yeah. And that's like, that's kind of one of the end goals of, of Moneyball marketing is to turn marketing spend into a variable cost. Meaning as long yeah. as I hit the, the targets, there shouldn't be a limit on the budget. Right now, a CFO will say that and then immediately cap you. But, yeah. but that's the reality of it, right? Is you want to get to a point to where you trust it so much that you know whether something's working like that and you can adjust in and out of whatever program, channel, spend, campaign, whatever it is quickly when, and, and react more quickly and be more agile so that you're always maximizing the dollar return on what you're spending. No, I, I love that. And what you're actually talking about too is really helping understand like how does the whole machine work? And so my, just quickly, like maybe like give a tactical example. Um, prior to Common Room, I spent 10 years at a company, Okta, so a cloud security company. Some of you may sign in with it every day. Um, but I ran finance there for many years. And one of the things that you're talking about, and it reminds me of, is that we had a great marketing team that had learned this also. And what it meant tactically was, if you want to increase your bookings target, as an example, it's not just hiring more salespeople. And it becomes something that like it toggles and you understand what you need to do to really make the entire go to market m machine work. And then it's a much different relationship, yep. right. That you have essentially with the success of the company as a, as, as a marketing leader. So I love that. Um, any other learnings you want to share? Otherwise I think we're going to go to, to, <laughs> to Q and a. Yeah. I, um, you know, I guess just the one thing, and, and we talked about this earlier, right. But Right now, if we really want to win and we really want to get ahead as marketers, I think we have to stop being, because I hear this too much, right? We're, we're just pushing back against new technology too much. Mm -hmm. um, and, and no, not every new technology, including chat GBT, is the silver bullet that's going to make marketing all that much easier. But when you hold back, you're just putting yourself at a loss relative to those who adopt these technologies and figure out how to maximize them, right? So, yeah. so don't do it and don't let your teams do it. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Um, if we have, I think our first question from Nick, um, I can answer this a bit, but how do you start applying a money ball marketing approach to your organization? And then what early signals do you look for in terms of scaling it? Yeah. So it's kind of that, the thing I just said a little bit ago, right? You build that yeah. funnel. And yeah. once you start really being able to predict what the funnel is going to do, um, that's the beginning of it, right? And then the next thing you got to do out is start building the correlated funnel, right? Because your funnel is almost always going to be like what you know for sure, right? Your last touch, your first touch attribution, whatever it is. But then you do something like display advertising and it's like, okay, well, we did display advertising. We got zero signups from it. But it's yeah. odd. All our other signups went up 30%. Yeah. It must not be the display advertising, right? And of course it is, right? So you start yeah. making those connections and kind of figuring in to, to some level of, of um, being conservative. What yeah. percent of the total is being driven by those things you can't directly tie? And you just build it all up. And that's how you start, right? Yeah. And that's how then when you go into new channels, 
you can do things like point in time test. All right, it was off, now it's on. We measure the two things, we correlate the delta to be the thing. Or hmm. you can always, you know, if, if, if you can, you can uh, do neat things like uh, ge geographical testing. We ran yeah. this thing in Dallas and we didn't run it in Houston. And look at our results in Dallas were way yeah. bigger than Houston, right? That's the, what that thing drives. Um, yeah. so I mean, what you're kind of talking about, which is, you know, which is a whole other, I guess, uh, webinar or talk track is, is attribution, right? And how difficult that is. And yeah. people tend to, particularly your CFO, as an example, will look for the very, um, I don't know, straightforward, linear attribution. Um, but what I love here is you're saying, no, your job as a great marketer is to help understand that correlation and infer some of, you know, the actual stuff that we understand that's happening when it comes to great marketing. Yeah. You, if you're a marketer, you're not just marketing to customers. You're marketing the marketing to your internal leadership, right? Like you have to make those ties and you have to help them yeah. understand what those correlations are so that they keep the machine going. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got uh, we've got a mix of folks on the call, both some great, you know, growth marketers um, or demand gen marketers, depending on what they call themselves, I guess, uh, as well as community leaders. We touched briefly on the importance of community at your time at AWS and, and Smartsheet. Maybe just a bit more on how you partnered with those teams um, and, you know, any Thing around like shared programs you ran or like, you know, just dig a bit more into that partnership and what it looked like. Yeah, I see, I see my team as a service for, for all of those kinds of teams, whether it's the community team and you don't have yep. a DevRel program or the DevRel team, right? Yep. What you do is enable them, right? So give them the tools to maximize attendance to whatever events they're at and to get the, you know, the right customers to make sure that uh, if you're in a city where you've got high-end customers, if those high-end customers know that your DevRel team is there doing something cool, right? Like that's real simple. But then beyond that, we give them ways to start measuring the influence that they're having on our funnel, right? So now in the same way that I tie attribution or create attribution to display, I create attribution to what my community teams are doing. And I say, this is how you're helping to move the needle, right? Because they want to know that beyond the personal connections and things that they're doing with our customers, that they're also helping the bottom line. And so yeah. I strive to make that available to them. And I strive to make sure that they have what they need to track as much as they can, to see the results of their work, and that we champion their work as part of marketing results, right? They're yeah. not just driving connection, they're driving marketing results. Yeah. Well, I think the reality is, um, you know, we don't have to beat around the bush. Times can be tough out there right now, <laughs> right? And so everyone needs to show the impact of, that they're having, right? Yeah. And as we talked about, these, you know, dark funnels or communities or, you know, whatever you want to call it, we know do affect things. So the more that you can tie that in, it's a win-win for everyone, right? Yeah. And, um, and actually, you know, because times are tough and travel is, you know, less than it used to be. Uh, the other thing with community teams is give them other places to show up, right? Let them guest host blog entries or webinars or, yeah. you know, give them virtual events so they can lead those kinds of things that help them find new ways and different ways to influence it and, and enable them to do that. Yeah. Love it. Um, and then I think one, uh, another question is coming in. Um, so I'm just looking at my questions. Uh, how, okay. How do you get buy-in from the exec team to like go into new marketing strategies? So for sake of it, like, let's use like, hey, I want to go after the dark funnel. I want to go put some money against it. It's not going to be linear attribution or whatever, you know, your CFO might be looking for. Yeah. What are some, I think that's probably one of the harder parts for a lot of marketers is that I call it the, the business case, right? Um, around going and spending money on things that maybe intrinsically, you know, move the needle but there's not that hard ROI that you can always show. Yeah. So um, I'll give away one of my biggest secrets, right? Which yes. is uh, <laughs> one of the greatest things I've ever been taught to do was at Amazon, I got taught how to write a six pager. And, you know, there's not an executive I've met that doesn't love a good six pager, even if they don't know what it is. Because the thing is that in slides and other things like that, there's a lot of how much are you not telling me that goes on. When mm -hmm. you write a fact driven, data driven doc that says, here is what I want to do. Here are my options and how much I can spend for each option. Here's the option that I prefer. 
here's how I'm going to measure results or what kind of results I'm expecting to see, then all of a sudden the conversation becomes, okay, are those results, if you get them, worth the investment that you're asking for, right? And you can kind of go back and forth on this and tune what it is that you're going to be looking for uh, based on what you're doing versus what the investment is, right? And for example, you you don't have to do linear attribution. If you present a business case that says, I, I'm going to run an event in, in Dallas. Let's go back to that example, right? And yep. we've got this many customers there. And I think that we're going to see a, a 4% ARR growth because we looked at these other five events that we did and, and p- correlated that kind of growth to the customers in those cities. And we think we can repeat that here. That's the kind of thing that they look for. They say, okay, we can't, what if it's not the customers that were at that event, right? Do you still take yeah. credit for it? Heck yes. Because you're there, you're in that city, you're making yourself known, even if they didn't come. They, yeah. you, they heard the noise, right? And yeah. so those are the, the, the calls and the ties that you make that you present to your leadership and get buy-in on. Cool. I think that makes total sense. I think, yeah, I joke about this. I mentioned I ran finance for a while at Okta, but the number of people that ask for money that don't really even have a plan, they're like, hey, I need $100,000 to do X. It's like half the time you're just like, hey, you showed up with an actual plan. You showed up with a six-pager Sure, you get money just as a reward yeah. for doing your job. Right? Yeah, and that's that's why that's the secret <laughs> weapon. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we got a question. Uh, are you able to share any real world examples of how you've been able to leverage AI in your marketing efforts? Yeah, I, I can actually give you one really good one uh, that we use today. As you might imagine, our content team uh, was very apprehensive about the existence of Jasper. Uh, before ChatGPT, then ChatGPT, et cetera, right? And, and for good reason. They'd actually tested it. They bought in, they went, they tried it, they got stuff out and they said, Andy, this stuff doesn't work. And it takes just as long to rewrite it as it does to just write it from scratch. We're out, right? And so we kind of hemmed and hawed and tried to work together on what's the best solution for this. And it, it became something really dead simple. We got our engineers to help create the prompts that go into uh, any one of these solutions. And then the end of the prompt is, can you give me an outline (laughs) or the beginning of the prompt, right? So we don't ask it to write the content. We get really good prompts from our engineers who are the same as our end users. And then we say, just give us an outline for a piece of content. And what it does is give you a a, a good starting point that then kind of one reduces the friction of that initial writer's block of like, okay, what the heck is this article going to be about, right? And how am I going to structure it? And then two helps you make sure you hit all the salient points, right? And so, That's helped us tremendously. The content team is now doing that regularly um, and they're really, really happy with it. And now they're asking, well, is there some kinds of content that's broad enough that we could actually just take the the content that's out there, right? Because one thing Google said, which I think struck me as really, really wild of them to put out there, right? Is they came out and they said, because we have BARD, we're not going to penalize websites for having AI written content. For me, that's like, okay, hold on a second. So does that mean I can go have AI write 500 generic articles that have very little to do with my company, but are going to get me 50,000 visitors a month? Like, it seems like there has to be some kind of gate somewhere along there, but they put themselves in a position where they can't enforce it against ChatGBT or Jasper or anyone else and not enforce it against Bard. So if they're saying they're not going to penalize Bard content, they have to accept everyone else's. So there is a place to start really testing the waters there on what you can quote unquote, get away with when it comes to using AI to create content. Hmm. Super. That's a great example. Um, and really, I think, and a bunch of interesting, I guess, data points. There. I didn't know that about Google. So super interesting. <laughs> um, okay. Last call. Any other questions from our audience? Here we go. See, everyone, now that we're doing last call, they're coming in. So uh, do you have any tips exclusively to increase brand awareness for social media campaigns for a product yet to be launched. Yeah. Um, and actually this will even way lay into another example for, for chat GPT. Um, you have to find people that have an audience that are willing to kind of talk about this, right. And yep. engage them before you launch the product. That's a common tactic. Uh, one thing that we've started asking chat GPT is, Hey, can you tell me who's influential in X category? Right. And so then it'll actually spit out a list of you can say on Twitter, you can say on LinkedIn. And it because those are openly uh, uh, listable or, or scannable, uh, it gives you a list like, hey, OK, here's 10 Twitter users that 
that get a lot of uh, influence on this particular category. So then you reach out to them and you start, you know, you say, hey, are you willing to talk about this product? Do you have a paid program? Or anything like that and we've had some people that are just say oh no give me early access and i'd love to share my experience right so it's not perfect it's not the end like the total end result but yeah. you have to find folks in communities that have an audience that isn't just you and your corporate account and that kind of stuff to help boost that message and it's worth doing it if you care about the product launch yeah and i think i just add um one thing just you know chase if it's interesting and feel free to email me i can find it but uh figma so the design company is a big customer of common rooms and they did a great job um, they've really their whole growth strategy but certainly when they started out was around tapping into these communities and these influencers however you want to call it um and so there's a lot of there's some content out there that i'm happy to share if it's interesting for folks that um that their community and kind of um, social leader has put out um, that could be useful there. So, okay, well, I think we're running up on time. So we're gonna end on that great question. Um, thank you all for joining, but mostly thank you, Andy, for your time and sharing all your great insights. Um, hopefully you don't end up swamped with a bunch of uh, mentor requests from everyone, but I wouldn't be surprised if you are. And uh, yeah, thanks again and look forward to continuing the, the conversation. Thanks a lot, Jake, I appreciate it, it's been fun. All right, thanks everyone. Bye.